we often we often watch it because it has an excellent program to it. I don't know if you saw the one on the Wright brothers that they did. Yeah, this doesn't do it. Okay, so Jacqueline, she can't have two keys. <laughs> We're rolling, Rex. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> all right, John. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. And, um, and by the way, everything we're doing is on tape. You can, if you start to stumble, you can feel free to start over again. If we need to stop for any reason, we can stop. It's no problem. And while we're doing this, you should be looking at me and pretending that the camera's not there. Um, the first question is the hardest one. I need you to tell me your name and spell your last name and tell me what unit you were in. My name is John Jarvie. J A R V as in Victor I E. And you were in the 603rd. 603rd right? Engineer Camouflage Battalion. Okay. John, tell me, first of all, what did the 603rd do? Well, they were basically laid out as an engineering camouflage battalion. That, that should answer that we started out painting funny sides to make things disappear. Of course, it never worked, but that's what we did. And doing flat tops, camouflage nets, you know, the big nets they put over the guns and weaving them, building the flat top by driving the stakes in the ground and hanging the flat tops on the, uh, the wires to keep them elevated. Then we had our regular routine of uh, rifle work, marching, arguing, uh, eating, and drinking. Uh, a, a good regular routine. And but now eventually, you guys, uh, your your job changed a little bit when you when you hooked up with the twenty uh, third uh, uh, headquarters troops, did it not? Yes, it changed in 1944, the beginning of 1944. We had basically done our training in Fort Meade, Maryland, and the entire unit came together in Fort Meade, Maryland. That's why we in 603rd have all been together for the full war. Same guys, same experiences. And uh, in 1944, I believe it was February or March, we were moved down to Camp Forest, Tennessee, still by ourselves. We didn't have the special troops with us, but we got inklings that we were going to be united with several other organizations, and we had to start honing up on new dummies, as we called them. We called them dummies and how to work with them. And the next thing we knew, we had a big warehouse full of rubber tanks, rubber airplanes, rubber artillery, compressors. Everybody had to learn to use the compressor, which became quite an experience later on in our uh, little game. But that's what, how we started. And uh, we got into much more rigorous uh, outdoor work, foxholes, and training in the mud, and all those little things that a soldier goes through. Now, when you went to, uh, eventually went to England and then to France, and got involved in the operations there after D-Day, you guys, along with the other units in the in the 23rd, were essentially kind of putting on a show uh, of sorts uh, with the with the German army as your audience. Is that uh, sort of one way to think of it? That's how it was supposed to be thought of, I think. Yeah. How did it work? Well, it worked simply by laying out a plan of what we wanted to do next and what effect we wanted it to have on the enemy soldiers whether we wanted to attract them to one spot so that there would be other weaker spots in the line or any other little thing just to, to distract. And uh, that's what we did. Did you uh, find it sort of striking that you're spending the war uh, 
time here um, inflating and deflating? Uh, you bet. Things? We complained all the time. I hate to tell you what kind of language we used, but all the time we complained. I mean, well, you can understand what we would go through. And you know, it wasn't guns and guns and guns. It's uh, pretend and make believe, and uh, there are a bunch of bright guys. Kind of a high IQ outfit, everybody but me. And uh, they just thought they were being wasted. And especially at, since uh, we, we all felt we were smarter than the officers. To tell you the truth, we were. And uh, we thought the Army was wasting our time. But we didn't get the overall picture of the whole thing. And uh, very often the overall picture didn't really play out until uh, pretty well along in the, in the war. When you look back now, knowing that what you know now, do you still have that feeling or do you feel different? No, I realize how important it was because it was important. It was, uh, it was very important. And uh, it was, uh, when I think back on it, more than I did then. It was dangerous. We were very lightly armed. I think the, the largest weapon we had was a 50 caliber machine gun. We had small platoons. We didn't go out in en masse, so to speak. We went out two or three platoons at a time, or maybe two coupled with another company. And maybe all of us were doing the same job from a different angle. And uh, when I think of that, we were, we were pretty much exposed. There were times when we went out, the compressors made an awful lot of noise. To, to forget the fact that uh, sometimes the dummies would deflate, that you would puncture, but to go out at night for instance, to an area where infantry is foxholed or behind trees or behind hedgerows, and then you go out past them at one or two in the morning and you turn on a compressor that can be heard 10 miles away just to inflate these things, you get complaints from the American troops too. And we got a lot of that. And I don't know what effect they had on the German troops who could hear, because I'm sure they didn't know what it was. However, our job was to, knowing what we studied and what we could tell about appearances of things, how we could position certain things so that they would be hidden, but kind of hidden in plain sight. So that if uh, reconnaissance planes came over, Maybe they would just see the corner of something sticking out, and they know if they can see one or two sticking out, there must be more that they can't. And we did that and had tank tracks, for instance, run in by half tracks to the dummies that went in. And uh, we did similar things with artillery. You lay phony artillery shells around and make it look as if they had been firing. They had flash stuff. And uh, most of that was done by the sonic, the, the flashes. And, uh, but we, we did the visual stuff, knowing just how to hide something or how to expose something is... Uh, it's not tricky, but uh, something comes, I guess, pretty natural if you're in the right business. You have to bring some of the artistry to that, too, though, right? You're yeah, well, that, that's the thing. They, uh, as they, they had said to us, if uh, we want somebody to tell us what something is going to look like from up in the air, and we're down here, we need artists who are pretty good at concept. They can imagine it and they imagine it pretty well. And I think that's true. So that played a lot. You guys also did uh, a lot of things with changing markings on uniforms and equipment. Oh yeah, that was almost a, a given all the time. We were, sometimes we have no markings on at all. Other times we had phony markings on. 
and at other times we had the phony markings on and uh, we did a lot of ride through with two guys in the back of a truck to make it look like it was full and the truck would go five miles and it'd go around a circle and come back maybe two other guys in the back or maybe three or four trucks would do this to make it look and they would have markings on those trucks it's to give the enemy or not necessarily the enemy but enemy observers civilians in towns who were passing this along give them uh, the information that they're looking for you would even do things with the shoulder patches is that right oh we made a lot of them sure we made a lot of so shoulder patches that uh, were put on and we were very often at the, the time I told you that uh, I was telling you before to get out of town they the, the combat command was coming down well we had gone into that town I think one or two days before why don't you tell me that whole story since the, we didn't hear it on camera before what, what's the story behind that well we were down in uh, Martini first show it's in uh, eastern France slightly below the the uh, Brittany Peninsula and we didn't know why they sent us there. I still don't know why they sent us there. But our job was to go in and uh, with our phony markings and phony stories that we were pretending to be officers and soldiers from another organization. And we were turned loose in town, a little, a tiny French town. And uh, go to the pub, order some omelets, order some cider, some, and talk loose. And uh, that's what we did. And we created a pretty good impression, I suppose. And I guess it might have been uh, the third night that uh, we, we were bivouacked. And as it affected the French, too, because they went through and cleaned their town out of collaborators. And they took them out of town. Now, I don't know what happened to them, but they took them out of town. And I think we had gotten pretty close to the fact that we thought we had our job done. As I said, I don't know why they sent us there in the first place. Well, I suppose it was to make the Germans think we had strength down there. And it worked, but the Germans had more strength further down the coast, and uh, we got the alarm in the middle of the night, around 2 o'clock in the morning, when somebody come driving in to our bivouac area. And we had a little story with them not letting them in because they didn't have the password, but they had the message, and they finally got it across to us that the Germans were sending a combat command. I don't know exactly how big a combat command is, but it's a lot bigger than us. Now, you, I have to interrupt you because you told me this story off camera, and it was a little more off color than the way you're telling it now, but you were so talking. I want you to tell me about this, about the, the, your, the fellow, who, what's his name? Uh, George Diestel. Tell me what happened. We called him Golden Boy. You know the Golden Boy? We were both out on guard duty. I was laying on one side of the road, and he was laying a little further out on the other side. And we just laid in the ditches and in the high grass on either side of the road till we heard a jeep coming in, and this had to be around 2 in the morning. And uh, as it got in close enough, George sprung up and he yelled, halt! And the guy in the Jeep started stammering at him and he said, halt, you son of a bitch, or I'll let you have it, something to that effect. That's what he said to him. And the guy said, I have a, an important message. A little stammering going on and he got his message across that the Germans were sending a combat command up. Now, we never got to see the combat command because we all loaded on our trucks and got out of there. We probably had uh, 90 guys tops if we had that many. And we got out of there in a hurry. It's a good thing you didn't shoot the, uh, 
messenger. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm not sure George was a very good shot anyway. <laughs> that wasn't his speed. <laughs> um, now, a lot of the guys in your unit were, were artists, as you are an artist, and I'm struck mm -hmm. with a lot of you, there's sort of a, I think, artists have a certain perspective on the world, and you and a lot of your, your fellows really did a lot of sketching and capturing of images along the way, uh, uh, which, is, which really is quite striking when you start looking through them. Well, it, it's just the fact that all those guys, 90% of us, were either working artists or were going to art school. And uh, you have kind of an inquisitive mind. You, you want to draw everything you see. You know, you want to draw, namely, and if there's something interesting, you especially want to draw it. And any given opportunity, the guys would draw. Later on, we were able to get some watercolors, and we worked with them. But uh, we, we would draw, and the guys would draw with uh, a fountain pen and spit. You make the drawing, and then you wet it, and it makes nice half tones in there. So there was, uh, everybody was pretty good at that. And uh, the watercolors, I must say that uh, some were better than others. The older guys really had their profession under their belt, but I saw one, one of our artists, I shouldn't have called him an artist, one of our guys uh, stood on uh, guard duty with me a while later, but this is one of the things I remember most. And I was trying to do a little, we were out in the snow, this was at the time of the bulge, and uh, we were in a little town uh, down in, in a touchy area that had been pretty well shot up already. It was bitter cold, snow on the ground, we were freezing, but we still had to put our guards out and so on. And he and I were at the entrance to town. I was on one side of the road again, he was on the other side, but maybe 200, 300 feet away from me. And I was cuddled up to my chest trying to do a little sketch. Well, he stood over there, and he had his hands cupped in front of him. And I couldn't tell what he was doing. And later, when I, when I got to talk to him, I said, what were you doing, Keith? His name was uh, Keith Williams, a very wonderful man. He said, I was doing a watercolor. I said, what do you mean you were doing a watercolor? He says, yeah, I did a watercolor, see? And he showed me the watercolor. I said. How did you do it? You don't even have a set of watercolors. And he took out his watch, and he had a watch fob. The watch fob was made up of three little watercolor buttons. And his brush was the feral end of a watercolor brush with just the hairs. He did a beautiful watercolor with those three colors. I, love, I would have liked to have had it, but you know, <laughs> I couldn't believe it, and uh, it was very matter of fact to him. But I mean, he was, he was a real pro. Well, that you know that really makes a. Um, I don't know another way of saying this except that that can't be typical of units in the in the ETO. I don't know any other stories no, of I, units where everybody's sketching and drawing and painting watercolors. I agree, I agree, and there were many guys who were. Uh, terrific, and uh, I have some of their stuff, and so I know, and I, I knew them personally and have retained friendships with some of them. Who are some of the people that you worked with who, who, when you, when you, who you think of? Well, uh, Arthur Shillstone went pretty far in the profession. He did illustrations for uh, Smithsonian Magazine. As a matter of fact, he did an issue that just told about our outfit with some pretty nice illustrations in it. And uh, I have a small 
collection of Arthur's battle sketches, which he did in France. Uh, Arthur Singer, bird artist, did all the United States stamps. He's one of the foremost uh, bird painters in the world. And uh, Art Kane, I don't know if you ever heard of Art Kane. He was uh, a photographer and worked for, he worked for Life Magazine, did a lot of uh, contract work. And he became pretty well known in the jazz field from photographing jazz musicians. But uh, he was an artist to start with before he, he became art director for uh, one of the New York magazines. Uh, I can name a dozen other people. Uh, Belisario Contreras, one of my favorite people. He was of Mayan heritage, and he looked at you knew right away he was a Mayan. And he would give up almost anything to draw. He, while we were over there, he wasn't doing watercolors. He did a lot of pen and ink stuff. And uh, I have some of his drawings. And he came out, and he got his doctorate in Washington and became a, an art critic and uh, quite a prominent artist. And uh, there are a lot of guys whose names I don't remember were very active professionals, and I know that guys who were on my level. I don't rate me up with them, but they were on my level, and they they were good. It's, it's I don't know, do you have a, a sort of a, a, I have almost a sense of awe about sort of that collection of people. Does that strike you the same way? Oh, absolutely, yeah. They were great guys, you know. It's something to watch a man sit down and do that, be so, so engrossed, and so driven. But they'd never let it get in the way of their job. I just don't want them to lose pay by that, you know? <laughs> but uh, no, really, they, they, they knew their job and they did it. Can you pause tape for a second? Yes. How much tape? Any minutes left? Yes. Then, uh, let, me, let me grab this. Let me just put this on your lap. Is that okay? Sure. I, I need you to mostly look at me, because we're not going to see this on camera, but you can just have it as a reference, and that's, that'll work. You'll be fine. But tell me a little bit about uh, about what those sketches are that, were, that you're looking at. These about. were some of the first sketches I did. They were not too long after the invasion, and this one is a church already bombed. It was one of the first crossroads bombed during the uh, invasion. And this is a church almost in the same place, a slightly different town that uh, we were able to get to from our bivouac area. We were sleeping in hedgerows and foxholes, but nothing kept us away from going someplace to do a watercolor. You made these watercolors. How did you, did you keep them and carry them throughout uh, nine months of war? Well, up to a certain point, you can carry them, and after that, you send them home. And uh, my, most of my stuff got home. It yeah, home? I'm, oh yeah, yeah. Who are you mailing it to? I mailed it to my mother. I cared more about it than she did, but <laughs> I mailed it to her. And uh, this was one of my favorite spots because it was the first that came along the line. Pictures, and in the remains of this church, it was in uh, Trevier. We might have had three or four guys in there sketching. Yeah, I, I would say at least four. And the little kids would come in, and they'd stand and gawk over your shoulder. The little boys wore aprons, little girls wore aprons, but different colors. And very often the little boys had a bottle of cider. You know, little kids, five years old, but uh, they didn't have chocolate. And uh, they'd hang around, and then they'd hold up a little piece of stained glass, 
that came out of those windows when the place was bombed. Some of them were intact. And uh, we'd bargain them for the little pieces with a piece of chocolate. And I brought some of that home with me, and I have it framed. I, with the backlighting, it looks good. Wow. But uh, those little kids were there, and uh, there were a lot of pictures of them in the albums, too. What else have we got in this album? She's got some stuff marked over here. I don't know what that is. Oh. Like it's on. <laughs> oh, what are you laughing at? I'm laughing at, I remember taking these pictures. About yeah, we had a. If you wanted a bath, you put water in your helmet, stripped down, and you took a bath in your helmet. We all took turns, and sometimes all at the same time, so nobody had any privacy. And that's what these pictures are, and that's why I laugh. <laughs> I, I laugh every time I look at them. And nobody cared, you know. <laughs> this was one of my closest buddies. Here, he he died last October, but he was at more of these reunions than I have been. He came to the first one with me, and uh, things happened in between, so he, he got back to more than I did. What was his name? His name was Fred Schmidt. He was German and proud of it. Schmidt! <laughs> big fella, big fella. Hard worker. I'm going to flip you back a page here for a minute from the back page. The, um, what, I was just looking at, at this. Who, who, what, uh, what's the oh, story that, that's here? That's a girl coming down the little roads between the hedgerows. She rode a donkey. And she was one of the native girls. And she's uh, offering wine. And that was very easy to come by. They were always giving us wine or cider. The cider was terrible, but the wine was great. And this was uh, a couple of guys bargaining for eggs at one of the houses. We'd go up and maybe one or two and say, avez-vous des oufs? <laughs> avez-vous des oufs? <laughs> and they knew what we wanted. And uh, we would bargain for eggs. And it was delicious. That's all that is. That uh, there are little things you do sketches of that to remind you later. I see the marking here. I don't know what that is. I do. This is uh, the foxhole that Ned Harris and I slept in for maybe a month on and off when we didn't go out on it. And uh, it was in the top of the hedgerows. The hedgerows are very high and very heavily overgrown with very sturdy trees. And uh, they were quite an impediment, but uh, they're also good to, to dig your hole in, and put a pup tent up over it, and you had a snug little house. So that Ned and I sitting in that, you can only see my legs. And this, is a bunch of us, we had been sent down for a shower to Quartermaster. They had opened up a shower, and the troops lined up, and you could have a shower for a minute. So you'd have a line of maybe 500 guys, and you go in, and there's somebody taking care of the shower, and you got one minute to shower, and then the next guy. So that was it. But Something happened in the middle. We start to hear the hum, loud hum over our heads. Now, we all knew what fighter planes sounded like and one or two bombers, but this hum we weren't used to. And we got out there, and that's this picture of us out looking at one of the first 1,500 plane raids that came down on St. Lowe and the area around it. And when you've seen 1,500 planes in the sky at once. You never forget it. They, the sound is so high, it's just a, a hum. And the, the planes, you just see a little white speck when the light hits them. Sometimes you didn't see them, you just saw the contrails through the sky. I'm gonna interrupt you 
interrupt you because our tape is running out. So, like, in fact, when you said one minute, oh, yeah. I, I don't Pictures know. Pictures of her I mean, playing think about the, the situation. <laughs> yeah. That you take your thing, entertainment. That was her famous thing was that she could play the saw. I it didn't was like know that. It was a really I'm sort wrong. of a peasant yeah, right. way of making I'm music yeah. from, her, with you. I see. from her background. Oh. Make sure you're out of our show. Yes. I think you are, but. Okay. And Rick, you know what I'm doing. Yep. 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 I, I, I see it. Because I know you want to scan certain things, and now you'll know. Yes. Well, let me start off. John, who's that on the left hand side? That's Belisario. That's just a little caricature I did of him. I don't think I even had him there when I did it. He had a face you don't forget. And I have several other sketches of him someplace in here, but. I thought, I've got to put Belisario down on paper, so I did this. And uh, he, he was some guy. He was married before he went overseas, but he liked the ladies when he got there, and uh, the ladies liked him for some reason. I'll never know why. But <laughs> he was a great guy and very talented, very talented. I have several sketches by him all through these series. I'm going to flip you forward this way, and there's a whole series of sketches in here that are of people's faces. And I want you to tell me about who some of these, who these people are, and why you sketch them. These are all Russian girls and guys. There's a mixture here. And we were in Luxembourg. We got to Luxembourg in September, and I think it was in October. probably late October, that we found out that uh, the people of Luxembourg had Russian escapees billeted in a, like a schoolhouse behind the cathedral in Luxembourg City. And we went down to see what was going on. And uh, the first night I went in there, I thought, my God, they've got young girls in here. Well. They were as old as I was, but I think of it now when I say young girls. And, and guys, and they were just jammed into these rooms, maybe four high bunks, and the bunks were side by side. So I did these sketches, and there were different characteristics came out in all of them. You know, some of them, this one was polished and beautifully, she had fair skin and all scrubbed, her hair was gorgeous. And this was Mama. Mama kept those girls in line. And you can tell, that was Mama. This was a young fella that, that he was just friendly, but he couldn't speak English. But I had them all sign their names on here. And the funny thing is, there was another girl, and she was, uh, I mean, I would say she was of questionable character. Figure it out for yourself. Popular, all, huh? All the way through, yes. And, uh, but they were all in the same boat, you know? They were where they were free. Do you have any idea what happened to them? Well, as it came down through the grapevine, and I read it someplace later, so I believe it. When the war ended, they were sent home to Russia, and they were shot for having worked for the Germans. Now, that may or may not be true, but I got that from several sources, and uh, it's too late now to check on it. I'm sure. And this is something coincidental. This was a sketch of me done by my friend Fred at a separate time. And he sent it to me about a year ago. He said, John, I came across this sketch. And he says, I thought you might like to have it. And I said, sure, Fred. And I turned it over. And who's on the back of it? But a sketch Fred did of this girl. Only she has a gun over her shoulder. Now, I never saw her with a gun. Maybe she was more scared of Fred than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it was a coincidence because it was so many years later. And I said, hey, Fred, I didn't even know you went down there to see those girls. 
Well, that's the story of the, the girls in the... What else have we got, Martha? Martha's our notebook keeper here, so I'm letting her... We've got some wonderful artwork here. Um, and I really like the colors that they used. Yeah. Um, and I think that was wonderful, uh, how several people would take the same themes. And this is in Trier. Is it Trier? That's uh, Habe La Vie. As a matter of fact, that is the yeah, town... Put this in your lap. John, don't forget to look at me as much as you can. Okay. But I you know, you can refer to all that stuff. This is Habe La Vie. Now, it's uh, the town that I told you I stood outside on guard duty, and my buddy across the road did a watercolor with little three dots. And, well, this is where it was. And these are sketches I made there just to kind of get the atmosphere. I wasn't even sure how I wanted to draw it, but I got a picture out of it. And this little girl lived behind the church in Habe La Vie. She was the midwife's daughter, and uh, she posed for me. And uh, the thing is that, and this is the town, and uh, Belisario and I were out on the road. We were standing maybe 300 yards apart. And I was doing a sketch, which was this. And he was doing a sketch of the same thing, but further up the road. And he later mailed it to me. And uh, I was thrilled to see it. And I said, yeah, I didn't know you really had finished that off, Belisario. But uh, that's what we did. This town was very well shot up by the Germans. How did you have any time to do your job? <laughs> This is a lot of work. Uh, this is a lot of stuff. I know, here. yeah. I could have left the Army behind and did all this work. But uh, when we finally got back to our barracks, we had nothing to do but lay around. And if you want to read or write letters, the guys drew or painted all the time. Arthur Singer, the bird artist, if we, they put us in some place that we were going to be in for two weeks, Sure as shooting, one wall of that place would have beautiful birds and animals on it, done by Arthur. He'd do the whole wall, think nothing of it. And he never penciled it in, or he just took his brushes and painted it. He was good. And right. these are photographs of Habe La Vie and, and the coldness of it. How do you spell uh, Habe La Vie? Is it H A B A Y L apostrophe capital V I E L L E. Habe la vie. Very often it just goes under the name of Habe because there is a Habe la vie and a Habe, uh, I don't know, Habe la old, I suppose. I don't know how they say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was cold. And here's a guy out on guard duty like uh, Keith was when he did his watercolor. Was it, was it? Bitter cold. Was it hard operating the compressors and inflating the tanks and everything in the cold weather? Yes, yeah, sometimes it was hard to start them and sometimes the, the equipment would uh, puncture God knows what. But, uh, we always made do. The guys really knew the compressors inside out. But uh, we had enough compressors. If one failed, we'd start, them, start a couple more. We have like four platoons in a company, and each platoon had a, had a compressor. You know, one of the things that, um, I don't know what we've got in the other notebook, but one of the, one of the words when, when uh, not to put words in Martha's mouth, but one of the words, uh, that I've heard her mention more than one in talking about some of your experiences and some of the things that you ran into is the word uh, Calvados. Oh, right? that, uh, Calvados. Is that something that the, uh, that the fellows in the, in the unit had an, an appreciation for or any, any, uh, any stories? Well, any time they could get it, they had appreciation for it, but it was hard to get. And uh, I wanted to send a bottle home to my father. And we were billeted in a seminary in Luxembourg. 
this seminary was a piece of work. It was like five stories high. And we had the top rooms in the seminary. The Germans had had it before us. And all the nice polished floors were ground up with the boots. And they had big Superman murals on all the walls. So that's where we were staying. However, I still wanted to send the Calvados home to my father, and I finally got a bottle, which I nursed, till I had a chance to send it home. Everything had to be censored. Like, all the letters in here have censor marks on them. So I said, I'll get down to the censor, and I'll, I'll do it. He'll be surprised. Probably knock him on his butt, but I'll send it to him. So I went, and I'm on my way down the five stories to the sensor was down on the bottom floor. And I hid it under my jacket so the guys wouldn't see it. Very carefully walked down those stairs, and I got to the bottom flight, and I let it slip, and it fell out the bottom of my jacket and smashed, and you could smell that Calvados all over that seminary. Down the halls, up on the top floor, you could smell it. I was brokenhearted. My father never knew the difference. <laughs> <laughs> What's the unfolded sketch in front of you? This is Brie, France, one of the most interesting towns visually. That's why I did this, because this uh, my, was my impression of it. The streets go down. They should have steps instead of streets, but they have streets, cobblestone streets. You step on the wrong, you go down three or four flights before you can stop. And it's a wonderful town. And this is a drawing that Belisario did of the same spot at a different time. He, he sent it to me later. I love this drawing. I love that town. I had a dear friend there. I don't know if she's in them. No, she's here, yeah. But I guess the, that's probably one of the reasons I like that town so much, because I met a friend. And, Is there a picture uh, of her? Hmm? Is there a picture of her? Yes. Here's a picture of her. Uh, I'm not sure what it says, something about sending it to me on her 20th birthday. That's her. Don't want to buy. What's her name? Does it have anything about it? Uh, pretty, pretty blonde. Pretty blonde. She's, I guess she was 19 when I met her. And uh, I was 20. And, uh, you know, during the war, how you meet someone. She was very shy, and I wasn't that forward, as a matter of fact. But we met, and uh, we became friends, good friends. And she took me home to meet her parents, which is, that's a good girl. <laughs> yeah, that's what. French fathers like. And, uh, you know, that kind of impressed me too. So I spent several nights at her house. And uh, we sat and listened to uh, Lee Jazz on the underground radio and danced and talked and uh, communicated in my bumbling French. She had, had no English at all, so we got along. But we got along, that's all, you know. I had a, an interesting story, which happened the last night I saw her. At that time, the Germans were putting on American uniforms and coming through the lines and trying to stir up trouble. So there was a curfew. 
U.S. Army put a curfew on, I think it was 9 o'clock. And I was at her house this night, and the next thing we know, her father says, the curfew was, it's past curfew time. You know, we're in trouble. And he said to Micheline, you better take John out and show him how to get through the lines. So she did. Took me up to backyards, and a lot of the French have uh, barn entrances on the street and a back entrance into the barn and out the front. And eventually, when we got to the edge of town, we were cutting through one barn, which was next to a pub or a bistro or whatever you want to call it, and we could hear people in there laughing, and they were laughing, and I just having a neighborly thing. And we stopped in the barn to kiss one another goodnight. It was pitch black. Next thing happened, a bright light went on, and the bolts on half a dozen Tommy guns or rifles all clacked into position. The bright light was shining on me and her, and all the voices had a, were around us. Couldn't see any of them, but could hear them, and I couldn't understand them. But they were after me. They thought I was a German. And uh, to be caught by the French underground, if you were a German at that time, was deadly. That's how close I came. If I hadn't had her with me, I wouldn't be here today. I know that because it was no secret. So I screwed up. I shouldn't have been out after curfew. But that's a little story that not many people know. Get out of that situation, and then what did you have to do afterwards? You had to go some distance to get back to your Oh, family. yeah, well, uh, when they finally decided to let me go, they talked to her, and then she talked to me. They wouldn't let her come and show me, so she said, you go out the door, and you turn, and you go to the edge of town, which wasn't too far from us at that point, she said, and you get in the ditch and you stay in the ditch until you get back to your barracks. Now, my barracks was probably three, four miles, maybe five miles back, and it was up a mountain one way and then a long road. It was very edgy, kind of miserable, but I did, and I never thought twice either. Got back and got through a hole in the fence, which we all knew there was a hole in the in a concern of fence, so I knew how to get in there. But uh, that's as close as uh, I'll ever want to come. Anything what else can I tell you? Yeah. What did we skip over here? You shouldn't ask. <laughs> this is one of the towns that was on the way to this house I was leaving, but that's where all the soldiers went. Need I say more? And these are pictures of the local whorehouse, if you want to for one of a better name, I'm sorry. <laughs> I understand. And, yeah, it, it was a busy place, I'll tell you. And we went down there to sketch. But we also had a combat engineer unit in our outfit, the 23rd. And most of the guys down there were combat engineers, a big, rough, tumble bunch. Not sketching. 
not sketching. They thought we were queer. They said, what are you doing here sketching pictures? And they were busy and waiting their turn and fighting, fighting for turn. And uh, I know one night we were there, there was a corporal beat the stuffings out of a master sergeant who jumped the line on him. I mean stuffing, literally. The floor was covered with blood and that place emptied. And the master sergeant must have been six feet three. And the, and the corporal was about five feet four, but he was tough and nasty. But they waited in line generally, and that's what these drawings are. And here's one guy who was propositioning the madam who ran the place, but he couldn't afford her. What else can I tell you? That's the story of my life. And these are guys sitting pretty dejected. I guess they've been waiting too long. And this is the madam, and she was a hard number. Yeah? Yeah. And she what was. Homicore. It's between Brie and Juf. Juf is the town that Mad Michelin lived in. And this was right in the middle. And spell the name of this town for you? This town is H O M E C O U R T. And is that And they pronounce the E in the middle, Homi Homi Court. Okay. I'm I'm bad with French pronunciations and spellings and it's easier to get somebody who knows what it is to say it so that I'll I'll not have it wrong. So what why do you say she was a hard number? Well, so far as I could tell she was a hard number. Okay. She ran the business. She ran the business. I guess she ran it pretty well, but uh, she uh, she just came across to me as a hard number. She That's how she treated the the guys, there. not the girls, the guys. You know, keep them in their place. I, I guess she was right. I'm I'm not saying she wasn't, but she tough baby. But the the girls were just making a living. They'd go out when they left at night. Their husbands would wait outside the door for them and take them home. Tough times. Yep, it was tough. I mean, the local, the side of that hill was also the local dump. And there was always a dozen people in there foraging through the dump for whatever they could find. And uh, some of them were looking for food, others were just looking for things, I guess, that they could sell. It was tough, tough on them. Do we have another book we haven't rushed through? You're, are you doing, you hanging in there? Am I, am I killing you? Are you doing okay? Would you like a little water? You're not getting tired, are you? <laughs> I'm wearing me out. John, we have some water <laughs> if you'd like it. No, I'm fine. Okay. Dylan, how are you doing on tape? Oh. This is Trier, Germany. When the Germans have it, it's called Trier. When the French have it, it's called Trev. But it was the, the largest city outside of Rome. This was like the second capital in Europe, outside of Rome. So it's an old city. And uh, it's all along the Moselle River, and it's got a lot of uh, vineyards around. And this is where they had a, a home for displaced persons when the war ended. So we went into Trier, and that's what these sketches are. And uh, as a matter of fact, we pulled up in a square in Trier, and pulled over because uh, we have a, had a lot of radio equipment in our convoy because of the Sonic guys. And we pulled over as they were announcing that FDR had died. That's why I remember the moving into that city. Trier was a shambles. It was a beautiful what was left. We were up on the top of a mountain. It's very mountainous. 
on the top of a mountain. That's why I did these sketches. And uh, there was a, a tower up there that the Germans had used. I might have a sketch of it here. I don't know. For uh, artillery spotting, you know? And we had a di this displaced persons camp outside of Trier that finally the war was winding down and they sent us back in there to guard that camp. Not to keep people from hurting them, to keep them from getting out and hurting other people because a lot of them were Russians and they really got out of hand very fast. And. Uh, so we had barbed wire on it. It was it was quite a nice camp, as a matter of fact. A lot of people have talked about the camp. It must have made a, a deep impression on everybody. I guess it did. Yeah, it made an impression on me. I mean, the, these people were confined in there. We wouldn't let them out, and if they did get out, they would uh, raid all the German homes, and people got, got killed. I mean, they, they got out and killed Germans. A lot of our boys killed some of them because they were out. The MPs would go after them very heavy. And uh, they, they were just all deprived of everything. Uh, that's the best thing I can say. And then they I can't say they deserve better. I, I guess anybody deserves better than that. But during a war, that's about the best you can do is put them in and give them a nice place to sleep and people to cook for them and facilities to for their sanitation. And pretty much that's how it was. But they were always trying to break out. So we were posted around the barbed wire and we'd lay outside the barbed wire at night, and we laid in twos. And you would hear the slightest jingle on the barbed wire and flash on a light, and you'd find some guy maybe five feet away from you crawling at you. They didn't care if they killed you to get out or just uh, beat the hell out of you to get out. They wanted to get out for whatever reason. And you'd throw a burst of Tommy gun fire across, not to hit them, to push them back in. So that, that was going on all night. And uh, so we did that for about a, not a month. I don't really know how long we did it, a couple of weeks. That was an experience that I didn't enjoy. Here, and I don't know why this is marked. Oh, that's... Elaine, that was when the war ended, and of course all Europe had been blacked out. And I had been in Luxembourg, among other places, for since September, moving around here and there, but we ended up back in Trier there, which is not too far from Luxembourg. And this night, the lights were gonna go on. Now, if you've been in the darkness for all that time and your lights are going on, that's spectacular. And uh, they did, and the city was mobbed. The town square, you didn't see anybody until the lights went on, and suddenly you realize there's thousands of people here. What a feeling that is. It's a, an absolute thrill to see it. The lights, all the blinds of the houses opened. The street lights went on. People cheered. They carried torches. and It, it was absolutely thrilling to see. I was with her that night. She was just a friend. It's good to have friends. Yeah. Say fragile? Oh, I think that that's old stuff. You already know that. Oh, it's just an old stars and stripes. Germans quit. That's all. That's the only reason it's there. It is fragile. It'll fall apart. This was my buddy Ned. Came back, opened this, 
an art studio in the city, successful. This was a strip map. Did you ever see an Army strip map? Yeah. Tell you how to get any place you want to go? The Army makes maps in a straight line, and they have a number at every point where you turn because they have the road posted with, every road posted with another number. So if you're going down number five, when you get to number six, you follow number six, whether it's a right turn or a left turn or whatever. But there are no names on any of the roads. It's all they had was numbers. And this was a strip map. I saved it because it was a strip map that was bringing us home. And it went from Germany all the way to La Havre, in three jumps. So that is a precious souvenir. And that's how we got away. I was a recon driver during the war. So I got to see a lot of things that a lot of guys didn't. But uh, that's why I'm familiar with uh, strip maps, too. What does that mean, a recon driver? Jeep. Jeep driver. You go out, you go out with your platoon leader and do recon on where you're about to go and you want to find out what's going on, who's there that might not like you, and so on and so forth. You know, that's a recon driver, but I, I put on uh, thousands of miles in Europe. I have a, a note someplace and a letter home told my mother just what my odometer said on the Jeep when I turned it in. It was thousands, thousands of miles and hell, it's only about a thousand miles, not even a thousand miles, from the Normandy beach to uh, where we ended up, you know? You ended up on the Rhine, right? The, with the Rhine crossing? The Rhine crossing with the Ninth, Ninth Army. Fortunately, I wasn't there, I'm happy to say. I was in Scotland visiting my aunt I, uh, when we got to Sarlautern, the Army decided they would take guys who had relatives in uh, the British Isles and send them on a furlough. And after Sarlautern, that's, that's where uh, Ruth's father got killed. Ruth Banker, you right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I got word that I was going to be the first guy in the outfit because I had Scottish relatives. And they didn't waste any time. I got packed up and shipped, and it was a one week furlough, but it took a month. I loved it. Stopped in Paris going, stopped in Paris coming back, stopped in Lemington Spa because I had friends in Lemington Spa. We used to dance, and they loved to jitterbug. And so I stopped there for a couple of days. And I went to visit Aunt Bessie. So that was my furlough. So that's where I was during the, the Rhine crossing. So, oh, anything you find out about the Ryan Crossing, I'll let you know. <laughs> the only thing that happened that uh, mattered to me about the Ryan Crossing, not that the whole thing didn't, but <clears throat> I had a, a Jeep that was in great shape. Nobody drove it but me. When we went in on Utah Beach, the entire unit didn't go in. We left a residue behind. We left all our trucks and everything behind, and we went in on foot, and we went in down the side of the, the ship and so on and so forth. So the residue came later and brought the vehicles. 
And of course, I had somebody driving my Jeep that just didn't trick. A real army Jeep is pretty tricky. He drove it off the landing craft into the deep water. For starts, now that's how we approached Europe when he wrecked my Jeep. I got it fixed up, Ordnance had it a long time, he had to do wonders to it. So when I came to Scotland on furlough, I had to leave it, the Jeep my buddy drove. Fred Schmidt and Ned Harris were in my Jeep during that operation and they drove it into a ditch and upset it, almost got themselves killed, so I shouldn't laugh. But they knocked the bejabbers out of that Jeep and uh, it had to be fixed again. So that's the only thing that I really remember about Viersen, which was that move at the Rhine. Well, you have a, a lot of memories, and you did a great many things, and it's sketched a great many is there anything that stands out to you or that you recall in the, in the hour or so that we've spent talking that I haven't asked you about, that, you, that has wandered across your mind that you think is worth relating? No, I think we've talked about everything. When you look back at the wartime actions of your unit, the 603rd, the 23rd, um, back to business, I guess, I guess back to the business part of your, your time there. Mm -hmm. What is the thing that you, that for you, that you would really like people to remember about this? I mean, now that this is out and it's no longer secret as it was for, for many years and people can share the stories and share the mission of the unit, what is it that is important to you? Well, something that, that I don't know how important it is to everybody else, but you think of it, and I guess other people have thought of it too, that if you tell somebody you blew up rubber tanks, here we're back to the beginning again and you were in the ghost army, and they'll say, what the hell was the ghost army? And then you try to tell somebody, you can't tell them in five minutes in any, any way that sounds sensible. It still sounds like nothing if you say it fast, good fast word. And uh, it just uh, what would be uh, a good feeling is if people realized just what we were up against when you take a, a truckload or two truckloads of guys and you send them out in, in harm's way, very poorly equipped, not poorly equipped for the job, but poorly equipped to defend themselves so that the way they defend themselves is to get out of there. And it was all very close. It just, people don't realize that. and. Uh, I guess you can't expect people to, not having been through it. But uh, when I stop and I think about it, I, I think to myself, well, you, you guys could have got yourselves killed so many times, and uh, it didn't happen. And uh, I think it was in Secret Soldiers, I was reading a passage in that, and they were talking about uh, awards for 23rd headquarters and a lot of the records have been destroyed and uh, the guys didn't get a lot of awards we got five combat stars which is about as good as anything because you got five discharge points for every combat star and the most you could get was five and that was good. But uh, there are other, other wars, uh, other awards, you know, just for, just for doing your job. No, nothing fancy, not a silver star, or not a diamond ring, just a citation. The unit citation was made, but we never got it. And like at the first, uh, 
the first reunion, we got a, a medal made up by the French. You know, and a lot of a lot of soldiers who were over there got that, and they deserved it. But uh, the unit citation was uh, important, and we never got that. And they're still trying to track it down, and people just don't realize what the outfit was about. And it would be nice if if they did, but there's no way you can get that across. I might have skirted the whole intent of my conversation. Oh, one of the one of the generals said had said something about they they didn't give out a lot of medals. A lot of men didn't die. You only got a medal if you die. You have to die to get a medal. You don't get a medal if you live. You know. And I thought to myself, he's right about that. You know, everybody can't get medals. All the guys that lived through the war came home. They were just happy to get home. I think, but at least give us our unit citations. All those guys in that room would like to have that, you know? And uh, that's not much. I'm sure there are other things involved, too, that uh, John uh, Walker knows about that I don't. And they're still working on it, but they're running out of time. The guys are disappearing. That's all. Before the Battle of the Bulge started in Bastogne? Yeah. You explained that to me, and it was a new story, and it was chilling that you and your guys went into where the SS had been resting. Oh, in the hotel board. why they were resting, and they were all yeah. masked. We tell me about this. And I don't think uh, a lot of the guys in the outfit realized this, but uh, some of us found it out later. We went into Hoshide, okay? An officer and I went up on recon, and we went up through Bastogne, and checked it out. We had to stay overnight in Bastogne and got up to Hoshide, which I never heard of, but a lot of people haven't. Met the priest. I showed you the picture of the priest, Marth, right? Mm -hmm. And he took us in and uh, we slept in the bishop's bed that night. That was hot stuff. But anyway, then our units came up the next day or the day later. And all we were doing was trying to attract Germans to our locale. Now there was supposedly, I don't know whether it was a training camp for German recruits on the other side of the woods. But the Germans did start to come. And all along the line, there were four towns all the way up in there that uh, we were uh, supposed to take the place of the 75th uh, Infantry uh, in rest. And we were. We were doing a good job of resting. Well, it turned out that the other side of the woods that we thought the German recruits were in and never would notice an increase in troops, the Germans coming in, because that's what we wanted. We wanted to attract Germans. The Germans were coming in, getting ready for the bulge. They were putting all their heavy hitters in there, and we didn't know it. I mean, not just we didn't know it, the Army didn't know it. And they had indications that that was going on, but they didn't know it, and the bulge broke through, and we got pulled out of there. And the troops all up around the, the Luxembourg front got moved back. And we got uh, moved back into Luxembourg, 
first step because this was pretty close to Luxembourg as it was. And everybody got stationed in foxholes all along the roads into Luxembourg, all the cooks, everybody. And uh, that happened one day, because the bulge started. That's why they, they knew it was starting then, and they pulled us out. And then they stationed us in Luxembourg, and then they pulled us out of there and shipped us back to Verdun. Because the one thing they didn't want it was anybody to find out about our unit. And that started another chain of events, which we've gone through already. But uh, that's how it happened. The deceptions that you guys practiced, I don't know, if there's, is there any one that stands out in your mind? I know you had about 18 or 19 operations between August of 1944 and April of 1945. Um, you've talked about that one, you've talked about a couple, but is there any, and you weren't there for the Rhine crossing. Is there any one particular one? One of the first ones, yeah, up and breast. Brest was a hard nut to crack. It was a it was a, a seaport that the Germans wanted to defend because they wanted their own navy ships to use it, and we wanted it because we needed a port because all the mulberries got wrecked during the invasion. So there were a lot of troops in Brest, and uh, I think that the army wanted to create an impression that we were gonna really crowd them out by troops in there. However, to make a long story short, that was uh, one of the first things we did. We went way out on the end of Rust. And the first, we drove for a couple of days getting out there. And we pulled up in, uh, outside of Brest and there was a small, uh, cavalry, cavalry tank unit. I guess mainly recon, but light, lightweight stuff in there. And when we pulled into that area, we came in and the guys knew. They said, oh, they've got heavy tanks. They're bringing heavy tanks in here. Just what we need. And they come running on and said, boy, are we happy to see you guys because we couldn't let them get too close to our stuff. Are we happy to see you guys? And we spent <clears throat> a couple of nights going through all the rigmarole, the sound effects, and all that stuff to attract attention down to that area. Now, these poor guys are sitting there and somewhere in their plans, they were intending to kick off an attack at, I don't know what day it was, but I remember the time. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. They were supposed to get dive bombing for 20 minutes before that, and then they would kick off their attack. But after the plans got changed, that we got brought in to attract the Germans, their plans never got changed, so they still had their attack planned, and it kicked off, and the Germans had overloaded that place with 88s, like hundreds of 88s, which are deadly, and it kicked off. Those guys never reached the line of departure, which is the point that they want to start their attack from. They never even got that far. They got decimated. And uh, <clears throat> what was I going to say? Well, it shows how much. Now I forget what I was going to say next. But it was it was really uh, really tragic because we we pulled up on the hill. I remember and the officer I had and I. His name was Lieutenant Anders, pulled up on that hill, and the 88s started coming in. And we could see the guys going, uh, the, these little light tanks and going down and getting creamed, and the 88s are flooding the, the place. And I'm sitting in a jeep there up on a hill, 
and they usually wouldn't fire at one Jeep. If it's a truck full of men, they'll fire at it. I'm sitting in the Jeep, and uh, he's out standing, and I hear a couple shells coming in. And I thought, holy shit, I gotta get out of here. And I tried to get out of the Jeep, and my gun belt caught on the wheel. I couldn't get out, it jammed in, down in here. I couldn't get out. And those two shells slammed down into the ground 50, 60 feet in front of my Jeep, dead on. Plunk, plunk. Dirt went up in the air, no explosion. That was one of my nine lives I got there. And uh, that was, thank God the Czechs were making their ammunition, you know? They had a lot of sabotage in their factories. They went through very heavy periods of sabotage ammunition, and I'm glad. That's what I forgot to tell him. John, did you think that the guys who were launching their attack were expecting your tanks? Of course, they thought we we were their yeah, savers. Go ahead and answer the question too, Greg. Yeah, we thought we were going to strengthen them. They, they weren't afraid to attack, but the, they wanted some of the heavy-duty stuff that we had because we had a, a group of combat engineers. They said, we need some demolitions men here. So we it shows the importance of how you have to coordinate the deception with the reality. Oh, sure, sure. That, that was a screw-up. This was not our screw-up. But somewhere down the line, upstairs, was the screw-up because the plans for all these things came down you know, we just executed them and did the reconnaissance on this and that, but we had no way of knowing they were going to kick off an attack. And they had no way of knowing that we weren't going to help them. You know, and it makes you feel lousy. I guess I think we should wrap it up before, you know, as I say, it's past my bedtime. Yeah, I don't out. want to start crying. <laughs> I don't want to get through it all the time. Rick, may I ask just one? There's, there's one, and I, and I, yes, I suddenly no, realized that I wish I had asked I'm going to let before. Mark ask you a couple of questions. Thank you, John. This is Martha. Martha was just saying she had she had never heard that the story oh, well, before of the dead shells Just, going just on. as well. Well, thanks to her. Just as well. Thanks to her, this, the story is alive. It's a good story, and it's an important one. Uh, it, it strikes me, speaking personally, my impression of the army and of war, I'm not like Rick. Rick, is, Rick really is a historian. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm just sort of a regular guy. My impression of the army has always been one thing, and thanks to today, and other people talking about it, I realized this this piece of it mm -hmm. that almost no one knows about. When you look at all the millions of people in America, it's not very well known. Yeah, sure, well. You had a unit that was incredibly creative and incredibly bright, which is also not how I typically think of the military. I think of it as perhaps as efficient and other things, but I don't think of creativity as being something that's out there. Yeah, well, we didn't consider it creative. <laughs> what did you think of it as? Well, once we got going, we thought of it as a job, and we knew what it was. The creative part was the guys and uh, the things they did. This, uh, the concept could be creative, but it's so fragile. It's extremely fragile. If one kink doesn't fall into place, it's tragic. And that was evidence of it right there. You know? I think of the, um, the Army as the last place 
that a lot of the best and the brightest would want to go. Okay, and, I, and, and you have to understand my point of view. I grew up in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I grew up, I was a, a kid and then a teenager in the Vietnam era. And, and the military is not where my friends wanted to go and in high school or in college. And they've gone off to Wall Street, they've gone off to Capitol Hill, they become lawyers, they become doctors. The incentive is different there. But you had a, you had a group of incredibly gifted, bright people. And without that going on, there, were, there would have been some different outcomes. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. A lot of guys would have been killed. More guys would have been killed than were. And, uh, you know, it, it's a question of what you, you know you saved lives. You don't know how many you saved, but you know you saved them. And uh, you helped shorten the war, I think. I think we did that at our level. I mean, uh, there are different ways to shorten wars, but... Uh, doing our job made some of the other jobs easier and made them more successful and uh, that's all we were trying to do you know the, a lot of these guys didn't want to be in the army it was a big war it was a big war and everybody went I enlisted myself I was 19, and I had a right to this unit because I knew they were open. But you had a right to them, and they had to accept you. It had nothing to do with the Army draft at all. And uh, then I had to wait, and I got accepted. I had to have a police clearance, all kinds of stuff. But the thing is that during the war, everybody went. The women went. You were down at the memorial, you know, the women did as much as the men. And uh, everybody went, and it was the thing to do. You wanted to do it. That, that's the difference. That's the difference. So I can see uh, if you don't get the proper reasons to want you to join the Army, there evidently isn't reason enough to go. I mean, they had something like uh, 13 million men in uniform. That ain't easy to do. 13 million guys who all want the same thing. I must say there were guys who were drafted who didn't want to go, too. Yeah, I concede that. But the majority were bound to do their duty, and they did it, you know. And uh, that's what we were doing. We could gripe, gripe about everything, but we still did our job. And uh, that's what I think the Army is about. Yeah. Get in there. You don't have to love it. And you know, if you love it, you turn into a career soldier. And we had a career soldier in uh, charge of our unit. And they got rid of him. But he really screwed things up a lot. You know, he made it unpleasant. I'm not saying it had to be a ha-ha happy time, but it didn't have to be miserable, you know. And he just was a miserable. So. Uh, 